All right. Good evening. Happy Thursday. Uh, it's actually been a few days since I've been live with you guys. Uh, Sunday, of course, was just a recording. Uh, hope that that went well. Saw the comments on that. Thank you. Uh, hope the re hope your week went well. As uh, also uh, enjoyed Pastor Darren's uh, study on Galatians. There, trying to catch all that. Always so much to do. Good evening, everyone. Tim and Karen. Um, uh, hopefully, something went well before you this week. I finally got my glasses fixed. Uh, the very last Sunday that we met together, seven weeks ago, March fifteenth, I uh, my glasses the the rim underneath snapped. And I had to. Use, I've been using my spares, which have not had the glare and a little bit weaker prescription, so it was giving me pounding headaches. But I finally got my glasses fixed on Monday, uh, and so it feels good to kind of have my vision restored in a sense. So good to be with you all. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, so I went into the eye doctor and got that all fixed. Uh, as I see everyone logging on here, we're, tonight we're talking a little bit of apologetics. Uh, going to talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, and the importance of that, too. Uh, and Of course, if you have never heard the word apologetics, right, it sounds like the word apology, like I'm giving an apology here, and I'm going on an apology tour. Uh, that's not at all what apologetics means, especially in the Christian tradition. Uh, apologetics is you know, Greek, a Latin word for making a defense for something. You know, building a case, presenting the arguments, examining the evidence. Uh, that's what we'll be getting into a little bit tonight. I'm a little bit more on the technical side, but also uh, really good stuff. Uh, I'll be sharing, so Dana will be sharing some of the resources I sent her uh, to be posted and things like that. A lot of good videos you can watch on this. Um, good uh, books. I'll share some before we get started. Uh, hello, good evening, everyone. Hello, Karen. Hello, uh, Kaylin. Uh, so we'll be sharing some of that. We'll sing a hymn, This Joyful Easter Tide, uh, which talks about the, the resurrection of Jesus and the importance of that. Um, you'll also note that uh, I'll share some resources too, and I, I'll just start with that before we really get into anything. Uh, the recent LW, the Lutheran Witness, and sorry, the letters are backwards for you guys. Um, but if Christ has not been raised, and they have some really good articles on, in here about defending the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you know, the historic resurrection that happened in time and space, right? We bank everything on it, and they did a pretty good job covering a lot of good articles in here on it. Um, also, some other good books. Uh, this one came out recently. It's Religion on Trial. It's written by Craig Parton, and he does a really good job examining truth claims. You know, every religion does this. Uh, and he goes in the book that only Christianity presents um, factual claims, like claims grounded in history, right? A lot of other religions, these are mythic. Uh, they, we know that they don't happen, and the books don't even suggest that they did happen in time and space. But the Bible does. Old Testament, New Testament claim that these things happened in time and space. And that's important to uh, examine, and we can. Um, and good stuff to look into. So recommend Religion on Trial. Good book. Uh, short read. Uh, he he kind of does the basics. He kind of doesn't go too far down the rabbit holes like we'll be doing a little bit tonight. Uh, but he does enough to kind of get you grounded and situated. So you're kind of able to dig into deeper stuff. This is a good intro book. Um, the other one, this is a, a Magnus Opum here. Uh, the Resurrection of the Son of God. I have not read this whole thing. Uh, it's huge. Um, you know, hand to scale here. It's, you know, uh, we got... 700 pages and then like 100 pages of bibliography here on his resources. He did it homework. This is N.T. Wright. Uh, he's kind of a world-class scholar when it comes to this. He really nails on this. Uh, good book. I've read pieces of it, not the whole thing. One day maybe there's just not enough time to read all the books you really want to read. But uh, a good, good hard case. He takes a look at all the resurrection evidence, uh, it claims in history, other, he does, he does his homework guys. Uh, and it's well worth it. If you're able to sit down, hopefully I can one day and read the whole thing too. Uh, so that's a good book. Uh, another book that I would recommend, uh, I've read pieces of as well, but not the whole thing. I've read the author a lot. Uh, Richard Baucom, he came out with a book a couple years ago on Jesus and the eyewitnesses, uh, and does a great job looking into the scriptures because the scriptures, if you notice, uh, they make little side comments and side references that don't make sense. Uh, you know, blows over our head. It's, uh, you know, stuff that you'd only know locally, stuff that only if you were there to witness these things would you make a comment about it. You know, like a, a nickname that someone had or, you know, a, a, another name for a location that only the locals would know. 
right? Uh, this is uh, this happens, in, especially the Gospels, right? They give proof almost on every single page of the Gospels of being written by someone who was there or interviewed someone who was there and was able to give these information. So we'll talk about that a little bit too tonight. Um, I'll, some videos I'll be sharing here as well. Reverend Fisk for Higher Things, he did a, an hour-long study on what we're going to be talking about tonight, uh, defending the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That That's a good share as well. Um, uh, the Lutheran satire, always a, a good a listen to for that. It's a good plug-in for that site. Uh, and they had a couple videos on the resurrection, you know, defending that and against the arguments that are just completely nonsense out there. So a lot of good resources. You know, when you get to apologetics, that's kind of what you need to do. You got to have a heavy hand. Uh, you got to come in with your arguments ready to go um, and, and get at it. And so we'll be getting a little bit at tonight. Won't be able to do a whole long thing, but I'll point out some things that we need to take note of. Of course, uh, where Christians fail a lot in this area is that we'll just say, I just believe, right? And then someone who doesn't believe, an atheist or someone who's against Christianity will say, well, I have hard facts. I have science, right? And all of a sudden, you're on the defensive. You look like the guy who doesn't know what, he, what he's talking about. It's almost like the Snopes trial, right? Um, yeah, the, the kind of the fundamentalist view on things uh, got shamed. Uh, but we have good, you know, hard evidence for these things. We'll dig into the scripture passages as well that kind of talk about this. Um, but first, when we dig in, when we talk about defending the faith, what we're really getting into here is epistemology. Epistemology is the study of how we know what we know. <laughs> uh, it feel, if you ever want a, a mind warp, uh, study epistemology. You'll never think the same way again. Uh, I went down that rabbit hole once and I came out on the other side, thankfully. Uh, but you know, you, you know, it's a good thing to look at. How do you know what you really know? How do you know that the moon is made out of rock and not Swiss cheese? How do you know all these things. It comes down to you believe somebody. You, be, you believe the evidence that someone presents to you. An eyewitness. Um, before, you know, TV, radio, and things like that, how did anyone know anything? Someone saw something and told it, or they wrote it down and shared it with other people. Right? That's kind of how everything worked until like 100 years ago uh, when our technology improved. You know, technology was the same up until 100 years ago for talking to people. Uh, so, you know, these things it, it have kind of developed uh, over time, but still it's the same way. I went to a bank uh, back on Vicarage, and I noticed a really interesting sign. Uh, on the sign of the te bank teller, it said, This bank is backed by the full confidence and authority of the United States government. The only reason my money works is because the government of the United States says so. Right? You're taking it on faith. Right? I give a, a piece of paper over the counter and the guy takes it and lets me go away with a product because they say that's legal tender and it's good, right? Uh, it's, it's just backed, you know, it's a, take it out of faith in a sense. It's, but evidence is there too, right? That the government backs it and I'll believe them, I'll trust them. Uh, even though we usually don't trust the government too much anyway for anything. Um, so yeah, everything that we have is because of eyewitness. I believe that the earth is round because someone has studied it, done the science and says, yeah, the earth is round, guys. Uh, and I believe them, right? I myself have never sat down and studied it uh, to make sure that they're actually true. I believe their account of what they have said. Same thing with the moon. How do I know it's not made out of cheese? Because someone went up there, walked on there, grabbed some, brought some back and said, yeah, guys, the moon's made out of rock. Uh, here, here's it is right here. And we're like, okay. All right, we believe their account. The scriptures do the same thing. Thing. We all believe an account of something that someone has told us. Uh, the question becomes, is this a reliable account? Is their authority true? Right? Are, are they speaking rightly? And if they're lying, why are they lying? Right? What's the agenda behind what they're claiming that they're lying about? Uh, so we get into the scriptures with this and we see this all over the place. Uh, that these eyewitnesses, this is the major theme in the Gospels and in the New Testament. Jesus, after the resurrection, says, you are my witnesses of these things, right? Jesus entrusts his mission to these 12 men that he has picked who have seen everything and are going to go out and say, yeah, this is what we saw, guys. This is what we heard. And this is what they did. Uh, uh, Acts chapter 2. We're going to read it over the next few weeks in church service. Peter says, we have been made eyewitnesses of these things, and now we're telling you what this is, what this means, right? They, they saw these things. These 12 men saw it. 
Um, it, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, this is the kind of the enchilada here, right? Paul kind of says, guys, if Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, this whole thing is pointless. We're fools for believing in this, right? If, if all we have is the hope in Jesus in this life, then who cares? Out the window with it. You know, if uh, someone, wants, if Jesus Christ, I forget who says this, uh, if Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, nothing else matters. But if Jesus Christ is not risen from the dead, nothing else matters. Uh, same thing, but it comes with a different point. Yeah, so, you know, there's so much to this. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, the apostle Peter says, we're not making this stuff up. We're not coming up with cleverly devised myths. We are eyewitnesses of his majesty and his glory. We were on the mountain when he was transfigured and we saw it with our eyes. Uh, 1 John chapter 1, I love, I'm just going to read because I love how John, John is a poet when it comes to this kind of stuff. Um, John chapter, uh, 1 John 1 uh, and uh, chapter 1 here. This is what John writes. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning this word of life, the word that was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest, made known to us. That's which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy is complete. This is why the apostles sat down and wrote their Gospels and wrote their accounts, so that we might have their witness still with us. The voice of the apostles still lives um, and is in their memoirs, in their writings to us. Um, and then uh, John chapter 21, his gospel, at the very end of it, uh, it, it cuts, it's, it almost like transitions. And you can tell that perhaps John is not the author of the last couple verses because all of a sudden it says, yeah, this, ap this apostle who wrote these things, we know his testimony and it's true, right? It's almost like the church that John was at gave their stamp of approval saying, yeah, this guy saw this. He testified to it. This is what this eyewitness saw, right? And this is what he heard. And this is what he's made known to us. And that's boom, we believe him. All right, so it comes down, why, you know, why do we trust? Because these witnesses said this is what they saw and this is what they heard. Now, of course, you can go off and, you know, th this is lazy scholarship. When people say Jesus never existed, boulder dash, right? They haven't sat down and looked at the accounts. We know more about Jesus existing than we do Alexander the Great. Uh, other historical stuff has given a large pass on this. Uh, but of course, also the claims of Christianity are also much greater than that. So we, we should expect a little bit more uh, scrutiny when we, when we see these things because the claims of Christianity that someone raised, was raised from the dead uh, are high, right? Usually some people, what they'll say is that it can't happen, so it didn't happen, right? Which is a dumb theory. It's a naturalist, a materialist kind of answer um, that because it can't happen, it didn't happen. Uh, okay. Uh, there's no evidence before that decides that we've never observed it before. But how do you know? Unless you throw out all the examples of it happening, um, which is what the scriptures do, right? They'll, they'll take a look and say, well, we can't count the Bible, so that's out of the window. Well, it's just kind of like saying, well, we can't count gravity, so all these people who say gravity exists will throw that out of the window because we can't trust their opinion. Um, it's lazy scholarship. Um, they can do better. So yeah, but if you really want to, you know, if you want to attack Christianity, stop attacking the flies. Uh, you want to go after the camel, right? And that's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is where it all comes together. This is, uh, we put all the eggs in the basket here. So did it happen? The history uh, and things like that. Uh, N.T. Wright, when he, his kind of conclusion on this, he sent this to other people. And he's like, what, what do you guys say? Based on all this evidence, on the facts here, what do you got? And they, the answer is the tomb was empty, right? Right. Uh, the body of Jesus was gone. Now, fables of the re that the resurrection did not happen are as old as the resurrection itself, right? Matthew's gospel, uh, at the end of it, right, the body is missing, you know, that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And these disciples, uh, the, the soldiers, you know, they, they go and say, uh, yeah, this is kind of what happened. And what do the Pharisees and leaders say? Um, we'll pay you off. Just tell people that they stole his body. And see, that's the thing. Soldiers, if they lost the body, would be put to death. And so therefore, that's what the Pharisees say. And if anyone comes get, giving you guys trouble, let us know and we'll tell them, right? We got to keep this under wraps. 
So the resurrection and Fultz claims that the resurrection did not happen are that they, they began at the same time. And, and Matthew says this story is still being circulated to this day that it didn't happen. But the thing is, it's as easy as saying, here's the body. There's the body of Jesus, guys. You're lying. Uh, and they never have been able to produce the body. And, and, right? the, the body is out of the tomb, right? Because he's risen. You're never going to find it. Uh, and things like that. And then as we go through, we talk about how can we trust that these things happen. There's several other uh, reasons. Another other examples that people give. Uh, there's the swoon theory uh, that Jesus on the cross, like Luke, uh, who's a doctor, right? We know Luke is a doctor, uh, which is another point I got to get to. Um, Luke, they say, gave him like a, a mixture that he drank when they offered him the sour wine that put Jesus to sleep. And so it looked like he was dead, but then when he was put in the tomb, like the tomb was nice and cold and damp and it revived him as if, you know, being stabbed by a spear wouldn't make Jesus go ow uh, when, uh, after he died uh, and things like that. And, it, you know, this is weak because if they claim that Jesus got up and was raised, but he was faking it, he didn't die. So they took him off the cross before he died and put him in a tomb, right? He still was crucified. He still was beat. He still would be bloodied. He'd be bruised. Uh, and you know, and the spear in his side, what is he, what is he going to do after the resurrection? Go, Oh, Hey guys, I'm alive. Uh, right. The accounts don't give that. Uh, Luke also, we talk about giving an account. Luke is a doctor, right? This is an educated man. He's not, you know, like the, they usually give the disciples were country bumpkins who didn't know left from right. Uh, Luke is a doctor, right? He's an educated man. And at the beginning of his gospel, he says, yeah, I sat down and interviewed people and wrote an orderly account of what I discovered. And this is what happened. Right, Luke is claiming here's eyewitness account to what we've seen and what we've heard. Um, yeah, so you, you get into all these things. You know, Jesus raised from the dead. Uh, that is the claim that the disciples are making. And, and you notice another proof for the resurrection is how the disciples are written in the story. If you wrote a story about yourself, if you were there, uh, you know, to see Jesus. Wouldn't you write yourself in a story saying, yeah, you know, Jesus was dead and I was sitting there waiting at the gravesite, waiting for him to get up on, the, on Resurrection Sunday, right? Uh, yeah, that's probably, we write ourselves as heroes, but how are the disciples written? These are cowards hiding in a room who don't get it, right? The, the change in their behavior from these cowards hiding into a room to faithful, bold proclaimers who are willing to be persecuted and killed for the faith, right, says something, that they saw something. And they heard something, uh, that the risen Jesus appeared to them, right? Uh, of course, you know, raised from the dead doesn't happen except for Jesus and those who have also been raised from the dead that Jesus rose. Uh, and things like this. Um, the fact that 11 out of the 12 apostles were killed for the faith, right? Thomas speared through in India. Andrew crucified on an X. Peter upside down in the Colosseum. Paul beheaded. Uh, things like this, you know, it... They died for it. And if it's as easy as saying, yeah, guys, um, it, he didn't really rise from the dead. Can you please stop trying to kill me now? Okay, I'll give up. Because right? these guys got nothing for saying Jesus rose from the dead. Christian, Christianity was persecuted. There is no um, uh, like the success story here. Like the, the apostles decided to tell a lie so they could make a lot of money off of this. Right? The disciples got nothing from this. Right? At the end of the day, they were killed and crucified for it, and they praised God for it. Right? This is their reward, to die like their Lord, to die persecuted for his name. All right? That tells us something, uh, that they weren't going to break. They weren't going to deny what they saw and heard, because this is what happened. All right? There's no mass hallucination here. All right? There's no, you, you don't have people, you know, go to even the Woodstock last century when they all gathered there right, uh, and did their thing. Right? You don't have mass hallucinations. People, all, groups of people don't all see the same thing. Right? And what the disciples saw, you know, was the same thing. You know, Paul even says, Jesus appeared to 500 people at once. That's what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15. Right? There's witnesses. In fact, he says, you know, some of them are asleep, but you could go talk to some of these guys and they'll tell you what they saw. Right? Uh, that's the claims that are being made about Christianity. Right? People saw this. People saw Jesus risen from the dead. All right? This is why Jesus, you know, they, he, the disciples are always disbelieving when, they, when Jesus appears to them. Right? They're like, whoa, this can't be him. And Jesus is like, give me a fish. I'll eat it in front of you. Uh, Thomas, take your hand, put it right here, you know, put him right in my wrist, see it for yourself, all right? The, the claims of the resurrection physical happened, right? Uh, which is, you know, it is mind-blowing, whoa, right? But this is, of course, how the scriptures are written. Um, 
And, and so we can go on to all this, that the apostles were all killed. Of course, the only one who didn't die a death of persecution was John. Right? John lives to be an old man, dies probably you know, at the, uh, around year 100 AD. Right? He writes his gospel in 90 to 100 AD, things like that. Um, and he's the last of the witnesses, the last of the apostles. And this is why he sits down and writes his gospels, left and right, just testifying. You know, John, his gospel, his three letters in Revelation, they're all about witness and testifying. And there's a reason for that, because John is saying, yeah, guys, this is, this is what we saw and heard. This is true. Uh, isn't it amazing? And that's another proof for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is the church itself. The explosion of Christianity in the first century Right when it could have been easily just dismissed and saying, "Yeah, the body's here." The fact that all twelve apostles didn't break under pressure. Right, uh, this is great. The guy who did the Watergate scandal and was interviewing the different witnesses and things like that said, "You know, we had uh, this Watergate scandal, and all of them broke within a, a little bit of pressure." And he's and he applied then the story of the resurrection. Of Jesus, like, but you know, it's amazing. These twelve guys went for generations. Right, for decades around saying that this guy Jesus was raised. They never dis- they never recanted of that, never backed off of that and said, Yeah, I'm just lying. And when they were killed for it, they died with their breath saying, Yeah, Jesus is raised from the dead. All right? That is an incredible proof and testimony of the church, its existence, the fact that the church exists. All right? This wasn't come up in some monk and some monastery and saying, hey, how do we uh, get control of people? Hey, let's tell them some guy was raised from the dead. Are you kidding me? Right? What in a remarkable you know, fabrication to try some bewilderment to try to say, yeah, let's cr- create the most crazy story possible and get people to believe that so we can control them. Uh, lazy. Uh, couldn't do much better. But when you don't believe in the resurrection and you, re- and you hate when your idols are knocked down, this is what you'll do anything to discount the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It happens. Um, so when we come down, when we look at the history, the epistemology uh, of the apostles and things like this, um, it's important to note, uh, the, one, that the body was never recovered. You know, no one ever said, guys, these guys are lying. Here's the body right here. Um, it, that these guys are trustworthy. They didn't get anything out of it. There's no bias that they were going to benefit in life because of what they've been saying. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot there. Uh, and hopefully, as you're taking this, there's a lot to it. I'm kind of excited to tell you. Uh, apologetics is a fun thing when you get into it. And also, we also have other things around the history of Jesus, other witnesses that testify to these things. Um, Of course, the best we have is the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We shouldn't be surprised by that. Uh, Of course, those are going to be the best. Uh, the church isn't going to choose some subpar thing, right? This is the this is what we're keeping. These four accounts, these four witnesses, um, here, and that's important too. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John play off each other. They read as four different witnesses, say, looking at the same thing. All right, four different angles. Right, you got your Fox News, your CNN, and your you know different news stations looking at the same thing and reporting on it uh, and coming to the same conclusion. And that's it. That's key. That's important. All right, it'd be bad if we only had one gospel. And no collaboration, right? The other Gospels play off each other and help supply information that the other Gospels kind of leave out at times. uh, And for their own reasons, because they're telling, retelling the the story of what they've heard. Um, But we also have other witnesses. There's eight of them. I can't remember all eight off the top of my head. Um, But hostile witnesses, too. Uh, And this is kind of important. You want to go into, you know, a bias and things like that. People who hate Christianity, uh, right, what they say about Jesus kind of tells us things, too. The fact that early sources, early Roman history, Jewish sources, they never discount that Jesus existed. They always will say, yeah, this Jesus existed by, and they'll go and say, but he was a bad guy. He was a, a sorcerer, right? That's a, kind of the Jewish account. Jesus was a sorcerer, um, a wicked, you know, possessed by demons, right? Which is what they tell Jesus when he's alive, that it's, he's doing these things by the power of the devil. Um, so that keeps up. Uh, the Romans, right, they kind of slam this Jesus, you know, they, they, these crazy Christians worshiping this Christ as a God uh, and things like that. Uh, we have early letters from late 1st century, early 2nd century talking about Christianity and Christians and this Jesus guy. Uh, and they never say he didn't exist, right? They're, they always will attack him. They'll always deny the claims saying, we can't have that. Uh, but they'll never say Jesus didn't exist, right? They take that. And when... And just by indirectly stating this, we know that it, they, he, he's a real guy. Um, so if you want to get into the history and other sources, there's Josephus. 
Um, he was a Jewish general in the war against Rome who got captured and he, he was, you know, they claim he defected. But he wrote an account of Jewish antiquities uh, and the Jewish war. And he references Jesus a couple of times. Now, there's some Christian embellishment that goes into it. But when we retrace the sources and things like that of the documents, uh, Josephus does mention Jesus. Uh, he also mentions John the Baptist. And, and in fact, we have a, an account from Josephus that fills in a detail in the Gospels that we don't know from the Gospels. When John the Baptist is beheaded, uh, the daughter of Herodias, you know, comes in and dances. We don't know her name from the Gospels. The Gospels don't list her. But because of Josephus, we know that the, her name is Salome. Uh, the daughter, Herodias' daughter is named Salome and because Josephus fills in that detail for us. Great collaboration of a, a neutral slash hostile source. Um, there's Roman governors who are writing about what do we do with these Christians? And they're referencing this Jesus. Uh, I think it's Tacticus, I think it is, who's a, a Roman philosopher. Uh, he hated Christianity, and he's writing stories against Christians to slander them and things like that. Uh, and he has, you know, lots of negative things to say about Jesus. Uh, just trying to say, you know, he didn't rise from the dead and, and things like that. And, and they, they go with these same stories. But there's a lot of fun and interesting accounts and details here of the witnesses and what do we think of this? How do we approach this? Um, right, because the, the stolen, it, it just doesn't add up. When you look at the evidence, the, the, the things that are all laid down, what you come to at the end of the day is that the tomb is empty and we have these witnesses saying that he rose from the dead and this is what they saw and heard and they collaborated. We got four accounts of it. Uh, we have hostile sources outside of Christianity that are kind of commenting on this. Uh, the explosion of the church in the first century, the fact that the church exists, um, and it bases itself off this historical fact and said, yeah, this happened. Uh, you got the, in the first, after the apostles are dead, right, we have the early church fathers, right? If there's anything you ever want to study more, go to the early church fathers. They're so good. Um, Ignatius of Antioch, uh, Polycarp, a disciple of St. John. Uh, you, you got Clement of Rome. Uh, you got all these, you got the Didache, these early documents and things like that. They also collaborate and point to, yeah, guys, here's what we saw and heard from these apostles ourselves. We heard these things and here's, we're backing up. Yep, we're, we're sold on what they've saw and heard, right? We believe them. Uh, we've tested it. We've looked at all the resources. We've looked at all the witnesses and yep, we got it. So we have these early church fathers, the successors uh, to the apostles who are claiming these things that what, what they heard from the apostles, and now we still get to hear it because we have their word, all right? That's what we have at the end of the day is their account, their witness, their reliability. And we go to that and we trust that because, well, because the Holy Spirit at the end of the day has worked faith in our hearts. So no matter what, at the end of the day, you can have all these great arguments, and I think they're good arguments, uh, but they'll never bring anyone to faith. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit only can grant this in us uh, by looking through his word, when we come to a knowledge of the truth, right? Paul, he goes to Athens. He, he's debating with these scholars there, you know, they, and he debates them on the resurrection of the dead, and they all scoff at him. You know, that doesn't happen. And then they, they laugh at him out, you know, and Paul's like, okay, but there's a few who believe because there's a few that the Holy Spirit works through the proclamation of the church that this Jesus Christ is risen. He is Lord. And, uh, he, and this is what this all means uh, for the church. Um, yeah. You know, it, a lot of good stuff here. Let's see, I'm getting getting close on time here. So there's a lot. You know, the tomb is empty. There's no body. These disciples go from cowards to being faithful proclamation, uh, faithful proclamation of not wavering. Uh, it tells you a lot. So there you go. I don't know if there's any questions of you guys seeing here. Let me scroll around. Um, yeah, take a look at all some of these resources that are being posted. A lot of good stuff. Uh, and I hope that kind of blesses your study with this. I thought to kind of end, we'll have a prayer and we will also uh, sing a hymn here, uh, this joyful Easter tide. It's hymn number 482. And Christina, I love the early church fathers are great. If you ever want to poke around, let me know and I can point, I can point you to some resources on the early church fathers. Uh, a lot of good stuff. And mothers, there's a few of the women too that we have accounts from as well. Um, yeah. So I think we'll go from there. I hope you enjoy this. I hope it gives you something to chew on a little bit more. Um, think through. Uh, like once again, I, I always feel like I'm making you guys drink from a fire hose, but I really do. Uh, there's so much stuff to get through, and I kind of want to leave you with that, thinking there's a lot I need to research and know myself. Um, so if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out. 
um, to myself, Pastor Darren, or anyone at, at our church, you know, we can get you hooked up and talk to you more about it. Uh, we'd be excited to, because he is alive. He's risen. He's the Lord. He's ascended on a high. He's going to come back and finish the creation, redoing it, remaking it, making it whole again. Uh, that's what we're hoping for, right? This is what the, their account, what their witness to us uh, reveals to us as well. So good. <clears throat> I'm going to take a drink because my talking rapidly has kind of dried me out a little bit. It happens in the spring. <clears throat> but we'll continue by singing our hymn. Hymn number 482 is Joyful Easter Tide. I'll do my best. I get a little shaky on some of the notes, but I'll do my best to sing it. <clears throat> This joyful Easter tide, away with sin and sorrow. My love, the crucified, has sprung to life this morrow. Had Christ, who once was slain, not burst his three-day prison, our faith had been in vain, but now has Christ arisen, 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 but now has Christ arisen. Death's flood has lost its chill since Jesus crossed the river. Lover of souls from hill, my passing soul deliver. Had Christ who once was slain not burst his three-day prison, our faith had been in vain. But now has Christ arisen, 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 but now has Christ arisen. My flesh in hope shall rest, and for a season slumber. Till Trump from east to west shall wake the dead in number. Had Christ who once was slain not burst his three-day prison, our faith had been in vain. But now has Christ arisen, 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 but now has Christ arisen. Hallelujah, Christ has risen indeed. Uh, we'll say a prayer here. Of course, before I forget, tomorrow, May 1st, we'll begin our week-long trek for up to the day of prayer. May 7th is a, day of, is a national day of prayer. So every day, starting tomorrow, we'll have various videos, articles, prayer uh, postings as we uh, lear learn more about prayer. Uh, give you guys more opportunities to pray. So keep a lookout on our Facebook page uh, the next several days because every day we'll have something. The Sunday School page, we'll have it for the kids as well. So keep up to date. Watch, keep your eyes peeled for stuff that we'll see uh, that you guys can be witnesses of the resurrection as well. Uh, so let us pray and I'll give you a blessing. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, that through him, new life has been won for us. We give thanks that we have the witnesses of your apostles, that they have come to us through these writings, that we may know, and that we may see, and that we may have fellowship with you and your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, send us your Holy Spirit. Be with those who do not believe in the resurrection and grant them faith and trust. Help them to see the evidence, but more importantly, to see you. You who are risen from the dead and have appeared to us in our baptism and through your holy meal. Lord, grant us such faith and courage that under trial and persecution, we may give a faithful witness unto you. Lord, we ask for all these things to your Son, Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen, Christ Lutheran. Have a wonderful night. Sleep well out there tonight, and we'll see you soon. Bye.